wherever you are in the world. I, I very much hope that you're all safe and sound. I'm Aaron David Miller, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment here in Washington, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a series of virtual conversations about issues critical to America and to the world. And welcome as well today to a fascinating discussion on covering COVID, US leadership in the time of pandemic. I guess it's an arguable proposition, but a case can be made, I think, that this pandemic is probably the most transformative threat to the global order since the Second World War. But for America, unlike World War II, the only war in American history that left the United States stronger at home with more influence abroad, the pandemic may well leave the United States weaker, both at home and with less influence abroad, facing a series of galactic challenges uh, and probably the most difficult national recovery since the Great Depression. A pernicious and insidious mix of a virus that we don't well understand uh, without a vaccine, economic devastation, polarization along class, political and racial lines, which the pandemic has revealed, and changes in social behavior have created a real witch's brew. America will recover, but it's going to be a, a gradual and difficult process. And what about America's role in the world during the pandemic? I've worked and voted for both Republicans and Democrats. And frankly, in my time in government, I don't think there's really a precedence for the absence of US leadership in the face of a crisis that has so challenged and threaten the global commons. Uh, Bill Burns, a friend and colleague, uh, noticed the other day that America first had taken on somewhat of a new meaning. Uh, America is first in deaths, first in infections, and sadly, its reputation for expertise, know-how, and investment in public service in the wake of this pandemic uh, has been badly compromised. So how do allies and adversaries perceive an America that's MIA in the face of this pan pandemic? Who gains and who loses from Washington's retrenchment? And finally, uh, what might the US have done abroad in the past several months to lead? And in the absence of that leadership, if that's the analysis, correct analysis, um, how fatal has that been to US image and, cre and credibility? And finally, my favorite unknown, is this pandemic a headline or a trend line? Is it going to produce transformative change in the international system or will it simply intensify and accelerate existing trends, some of which were headed in a very negative direction? More questions than answers as usual, but fortunately we have a superb trio uh, to answer them. Tom Friedman, uh, internationally acclaimed author, journalist, columnist for the New York Times, bureau chief in Beirut and Jerusalem, and a, a traveling companion par excellence when he was covering the State Department on the Jim Baker shuttles. Susan Glasser, now at the New Yorker, has held positions as editor of Politico, Foreign Policy, and the Washington Post in addition to spending four years as the Post Bureau Chief in Moscow. She's the co-author of a forthcoming book on James Baker, and I'm really looking forward uh, to that one. And finally, David Rennie, who I know only by reputation, and it is a stellar one, who is now the uh, Economist Bureau Chief in Beijing and the Shaguan columnist. He's actually done it all for The Economist, London, Washington, Brussels, and before, and before that, all over the word, world for the Daily Telegraph. So with that brief introduction, um, Tom Friedman, I'm gonna turn the virtual space over to you. Five minutes, please. Um, I'll only interrupt if, um, if you go much longer and you have an extraordinary capacity to do economy of language, so I know you won't. Tom? Well, Aaron, uh, thank you. It's uh, great to be with you, with uh, David and Susan uh, and, uh, and your audience. Uh, I'll make one, uh, uh, two observations, one about American leadership and the other about the framework through which I've been covering this story. Um, historically, American leadership in a global crisis, be it geopolitical, economic, or health, 
uh, manifested three features. Uh, we were the lead in coordinating. We coordinated the global response. Uh, secondly, we were a source of aid and comfort uh, to people being hurt or challenged by whatever uh, the crisis was, the global crisis. And lastly, we were a source of science and expertise for navigating a way out of the crisis. Those have always been the three foundations of American leadership in a crisis. And um, this administration is batting zero for three um, uh, in all three of those areas. Uh, we have not uh, attempted to coordinate anything. We've really gone it alone. Uh, we have not been a source of aid and comfort for others. And we have uh, been a source of actually misinformation, um, not the best science and learning, at least from the administration point of view. Uh, I will just share with you, uh, the, we can talk about this more about the geopolitics, the framework though, Aaron, through which I've been covering this story. Um, and the book I've drawn on that uh, from my own uh, past is Not the World is Flat. It's actually a book I wrote in 2008 called Hot, Flat and Crowded, um, which was about natural systems. Um, a book uh, uh, through which I <coughs> came to know a lot of evolutionary biologists and ecologists. Um, and so I, where I start my analysis is that, um, uh, uh, my daughter, Natalie, is the executive producer of Weekend All Things Considered, so I never miss it on Sunday. And on Easter Sunday, they did a, something very special. They did a roundup of uh, sermons, uh, Easter sermons by different pastors around the country. And my favorite was uh, uh, Michael Curry here at the National Cathedral, who ended his Easter sermon by singing uh, this spiritual, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole wide world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's where I start. Because just substitute he for she, she being mother nature. This is the first time for our generation of human species that we've experienced a world where she got the whole world in her hands. Last time was 1918, and unless you're 103, basically no member of our species has experienced a world where we are all in the grip of mother nature. Now, what is mother nature? She's just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. You can't talk her up, you can't talk her down. You can't say mother nature, we've been having a little recession. Could you take some time off? Or I had this beautiful stock market, which you're messing up. She will only do what chemistry, biology and physics dictate. And she always bats last and she always bats a thousand. Do not mess with mother nature. Now, the problem with Trump and the reason he got off to such a slow start uh, among many, but I think the principal one is that Trump has no feel for natural systems. The only natural systems he's actually encountered are golf courses, um, where he actually came to believe he could tame nature. If you play at his most famous course in West Palm Beach, he even created artificial waterfalls. Trump looks at the world entirely through markets and money, um, not through natural systems. And so you will recall early on in the crisis, he gave a national address, which was a disaster, sent the stock market down by like 2000 points. Then he fixed something the next day. I forgot exactly what he did. The stock market went up 2,000 points. <clears throat> and Trump actually took a screenshot of that graph of the market rise. And he autographed it. And he sent it to Lou Dobbs of Fox News. And that knucklehead put it on Fox News that night. While Trump was autographing that market graph and Lou Dobbs and Fox News were amplifying it, Mother Nature was silently, invisibly, inexorably, exponentially and mercilessly spreading coronavirus throughout our society and the world. And the thing about mother nature, Aaron, she doesn't start her day at 930. She does not close at four and she does not take Saturday and Sunday off. So we had a president who had no feel for natural systems. Now what is, and I'll end here, what is the essential thing you have to understand when you're up against mother nature? She does not reward the the smartest. She does not reward the strongest. She does not reward the richest. When she throws a fastball at you, and coronavirus is just one of the many fastballs, floods, droughts, um, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> forest fires that she throws at her species to, to sort out who is the fittest, who shall get their DNA into the next generation. When she throws a fastball at you, she doesn't reward the smartest, the strongest, or the richest. She only rewards the most adaptive. 
And she only rewards three strategies for adaptation. The first is, are you humble? Do you respect her power? Because if you aren't, she will hurt you or someone you love. Number two, she only rewards the most coordinated because she's evolved her viruses over millennia to find any crack in your individual or communal immune system. And lastly, she rewards only people who build their response to her, their adaptative, a, a, adaptive response on her raw materials of chemistry, biology, and physics. If you build your response on ideology, politics, or your next election calendar, she will hurt you or someone you love. I'll stop there. Tom, that was terrific. I, I'd only add that uh, uh, they, they claim that two thirds of the newly discovered pathogens in the world, two thirds are viruses, which is a question. They're, they're just like any other species looking for a warm, a niche and a warm place to call home. Um, this one happened to find its niche in bats. And then we took those bats out of the ecosystems. We sold them in markets, we ate them and they jumped to us and uh, to our cells and tissue. And we're such a warm protoplasm for them to call home. But unlike bats, we didn't evolve with them in the wild. And Friedman, I only say one other thing. You got a terrific voice. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Susan Glasser. Before well, thank you. Go. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you uh, to everyone who tuned in today. And yes, I was going to say, I've already learned one thing today, uh, which is that Tom can sing. Uh, so, you know, I count myself uh, lucky here in my uh, quarantine kitchen. Um, uh, I cannot sing and I will not burden you with that. I, you know, I think it's a great starting point because it, it's pretty clear to anybody trying to decode the American response or lack to it, lack of it, uh, that Donald Trump has been utterly confounded by having a, a quote unquote invisible enemy, as he calls it, that is a virus that is from mother nature uh, and doesn't give a damn about his Twitter feed. And, you know, so that I think has been one of the, uh, you know, sort of stark and defining aspects of uh, this very uh, unequal and asymmetric uh, 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 response that we're seeing from the president of the United States. He's, he's, he's actually confounded. And of course, what do people do when they're confounded? They uh, uh, revert to what they know, whether it is applicable or not. Uh, you know, just to pull back, what I would say is that, you know, it's of course been an extraordinary time uh, to realize that American carnage turns out to have been a prediction, not a description of uh, what the United States would undergo uh, in a Trump presidency. And as, as discordant and off key and just alarming as hearing that kind of rhetoric was from a president of the United States on January 20th, 2017, uh, it's even more alarming uh, to be sitting here in my kitchen speaking to you uh, at a t on a day when 90,000 Americans have died. Uh, you can uh, drive around Washington, the flags are not lowered. Uh, you know, the country is not mourning these people. Uh, and we have a president whose response has been uh, essentially to offer conspiracy theories, denialism, and to do everything in his power over the course of the last several months, uh, essentially to revert to the kind of extreme partisanship and division that have characterized both our internal, our domestic politics uh, in these last few years and increasingly our international politics. And, you know, what I'm struck by is that we, uh, foreign policy hands, you know, have tended essentially to almost view these as different disciplines in recent years, you know, that there's domestic politics in the United States, and that's a, you know, an increasingly unpleasant and distasteful scandal. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, by the way, that's a view that many Republicans as well as Democrats uh, who, you know, have often shared. And then there's sort of America's national interest, its geopolitical uh, strategy, which was often far more bipartisan than people realize. I think that's no longer the case. Uh, and I think what you're seeing is a convergence of our domestic dysfunction and the unraveling of our international presence in the world. Uh, to me, uh, what we're seeing right now uh, is, uh, you know, something I've, I, I've felt since the beginning of the Trump era uh, and even arguably predating it, 
Uh, but you know, the United States actually is the center of uh, geopolitical disruption. Uh, in the world. And, uh, you know, that is an uncomfortable and unusual place for us to be, uh, you know, as much as uh, we're still interested in what's happening in the Middle East or in Russia or certainly uh, in China, as David will, will talk with us about today, uh, the truth of the matter is it is my view that the single biggest uh, question marks uh, internationally right now involve what the United States is doing and what it's going to do. The very premise of this conversation is around American leadership uh, during uh, COVID. And the truth of the matter is there is no American leadership during COVID, except to the extent that uh, we are leading the world in deaths. And, you know, what's striking is that, Aaron, you asked this question, which none of us really know the answer to yet, uh, but you asked this question, correct question, clearly, which is to what extent are we seeing, are we going to see this time of pandemic as a, a disjuncture and uh, a pivot point in the world in which what comes after is markedly different as a result of this shared collective uh, uh, trauma that we're all going through? Or is it going to magnify, accelerate, and clarify pre-existing uh, trends? And Obviously, the unraveling uh, and the diminishment of U.S. leadership in the world is something that long predates uh, Donald Trump. And, you know, arguably, there's been a long trajectory since the end of the Cold War in which this was a sort of inevitable outcome. But I would just close with this thought for now. I don't think that what's happening right now in the United States, uh, it might be the inevitable consequence of electing Donald Trump as the president. But remember that uh, these people didn't have to die. It wasn't preordained. And in fact, uh, I keep coming back to this survey of international experts uh, who looked at uh, world public health systems and preparations for pandemics and came out with a ranking literally as the coronavirus was unbeknownst to all of us spreading in the world. Uh, that found that the United States was actually the most prepared country in the world to deal with a global pandemic of exactly this sort. Uh, so it wasn't inevitable that we would screw this up so badly. And I don't think even what comes next is inevitable or preordained. Yeah. Susan, that was terrific. Um, and um, I, um, I want to come back to the issue of uh, two points you raised. One is, is this a headline or a trend line and a real inflection point, as World War II was in many respects in a positive sense? Um, that's question um, number one. And then second is the issue of preparedness. Um, and uh, I take all your points. I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're factoring in, in the, the issue that boom and bust on dealing with well, the way the America has dealt with pandemics and the whole issue of viral flu over the last 20 years, we spent billions of dollars on fighting counterterrorism. And yet, uh, the, you know, there hasn't been a single terrorist attack, although Pensacola may in fact uh, prove that assumption wrong, directed and or orchestrated by a foreign terrorist organization since 9-11. And yet you now have a pandemic uh, which has proven to be a far more difficult threat. So yes, um, a lot of this was preventable. The, re the real question is to what degree um, were we really prepared for this? Um, we'll come back to those issues. David, over to you. Well, good evening. It's nearly midnight here in Beijing. So I mean, the kind of the news headline of where I am is that we're three days away from the annual session of the kind of rubber stamp Parliament of China. There was a moment back in February, uh, if you remember the death of that whistleblowing young doctor, Li Wenliang, which triggered this extraordinary outbreak uh, of, of really unusually explicitly political kind of rage on the part of hundreds of millions of Chinese social media users saying, you know, why, how did this man die? We don't have free speech. That's why he died. Then you roll on to that, the, the trade war with the United States that is having a serious effect on, you know, giant Chinese companies like Huawei. Given all of that, you could have imagined that for President Xi Jinping, when Parliament sits uh, in three days' time for that big annual session, that he could have been in some trouble because he could have faced, at least not in public, uh, 
some seriously powerful figures in the Communist Party saying, how did we mess up our relations with America? Uh, why are we so unpopular around the world? Did we mess up the beginning of this virus? And there was a time where some of those questions were kind of rumbling around. I have to break it to you in America that President Trump has let Mr. Xi off the hook, that now no one is going to blame the Chinese leadership for a bad relationship with America, because America is now uh, kind of across the, the entire of the Chinese kind of spectrum, seen as this dysfunctional proof that Western democracy doesn't work. And look at those death numbers. Now, I was trying to think before I did this, you know, how do I add value as a, as a columnist and as a reporter who's been out in the field? I haven't left China uh, since this began. I've been out in the kind of quarantine zones. I've done three different sessions of quarantine after going out to report to try and see this on the ground. How do I add value for your viewers in the US on that? I think if I want to try and make your viewers understand something about how it feels to watch America from China, you need to understand how unusual this virus experience has been in China and continues to be. China is trying to cope with this virus now in a way that is kind of unique around the whole world. You know, all of those pieces that you see about how, you know, Western countries are trying to flatten the curve. You try and have, you know, a number of infections every day that is below the capacity of your hospitals so you don't get overwhelmed hospitals. And then you kind of, at some point you take it on the chin and you balance economic opening with a level of infections. And so you see some countries saying, you know, should we have 10% of the population infected? Should we have 40%? Should we be Sweden? Should we go for herd immunity? China is not trying to flatten the curve. China wants no curve. China is in the process right now of locking down provincial cities at the moment right up near the Russian border because they've had six new cases. So yesterday in China, I ran the numbers, we had six new cases. Now in Montgomery County, Maryland, just north of, of where some of you are in DC, you had 200 new cases yesterday. But that city near the Russian border, because it has six new cases, is completely locked down. You can't leave that city. If there's someone infected in your entire housing complex, you are now indoors for 14 days. If you want to leave that city, you have to have a nucleic acid test to test negative. All buses, transport, taxis, gone from that city because they had six infections. And I think one of the things that's problematic is that because China did cover up uh, the very beginning of this, and because China has a history of lying about pandemics, I get the impression sometimes that people in the Western world don't imagine that there's really anything you can learn from the way that China is doing things now, because of course China's just lying. They can't possibly have this few infections. Well, they probably do currently have many, many fewer infections than even a single individual American state because they have locked this place down. There are now no foreigners can enter this country. Uh, there are 20 international flights a day into the entire of China. You know, a couple of thousand people a day coming in and out, all of them Chinese into this place. This entire country of 1.4 billion people is locked down tight. And, and any city that has a few infections, the sort of infection numbers that wouldn't even, you wouldn't bat an eyelid in America, they're locking it down, they're slamming on the brakes. Now, why are they doing that? What, this Chinese exceptionalism is, is in part because they, they nearly lost control of a big city, Wuhan, 11 million people. They don't have a good healthcare system here. They've built those shiny skyscrapers, those high-speed trains, the space program, those prestige projects. They haven't really invested in public health. So America, for example, uh, if you look at the number of intensive care beds uh, per capita, America has three times the number that China does. So they cannot afford another Wuhan. So they will take very serious pain to avoid having another Wuhan. That's why for February and March of this year, hundreds of millions of people all around me here in China, including me for six weeks, were basically locked indoors, forbidden to leave our own apartments. Uh, some of these lockdown places that I went to, you know, barricaded villages uh, down in the quarantine zone, uh, where they would have kind of mud berms that the villagers had put up and then old guys with pitchforks locking anyone with a number plate from outside the province. Uh, anyone who had been outside the province was locked indoors, not allowed to see anyone else. That has a consequence when Chinese people look at what's happening in America. And here's what it is. The Chinese people have been told a story by their propaganda machine, which like all good propaganda has a kernel of truth to it, which is you, the Chinese people, you sacrifice your freedom, and in many cases went without wages for two months, lived on your savings, in order to break the chain of transmission. Because a country without a great health system only has a brute force solution to this problem, which is to stop Chinese people meeting other Chinese people. 
The next piece, they're told, so you suffered for two months. You couldn't go out. Your children couldn't go play. You couldn't go to school. You lost your income for two months. To buy the rest of the world, like rich countries like America, time to prepare. But they squandered it. They squandered your sacrifice and they blew it. And because they blew it, they now have 80,000 dead and they have a president who doesn't seem to care because he's a racist, because Americans are selfish, because Americans are individualist, because they're decadent. And we, the Chinese people, sacrificed and they have mocked our sacrifice with their utter incompetence. So final proof that one party rule of the Communist Party is the only way to stay safe. Now, that's not true, and I'll end here. That's not true. You know, there are democracies in Asia that have done a really good job, like Taiwan, like South Korea. But as I say, like all the best propaganda, there is tragically a kernel of truth that if you're an ordinary, moderate, reasonable-minded Chinese person, you know that you beat this virus by staying indoors for two months and that you, may didn't, you maybe didn't have a salary. A lot of millions of people didn't have salaries. And they did that to break the chain of infection. Then they look at rich America with these fantastic hospitals, these huge houses, all these cars and money and shops, and they can't even be bothered to stay indoors for a few weeks before they start whining and asking to be let out and play golf and go to the shops. And from the Chinese public's perspective, they don't doubt now for a minute that this system is better. And as a Western journalist living here, for America to have handed that victory to the Chinese communist leadership is, is not just a public health tragedy on your side, on my side sitting here in China, it's a geopolitical tragedy. Uh, David, that's a truly a fascinating, fascinating set of observations, which could only be gleaned from ground truth, which is where you are, and that's what you're reporting on. But let me just ask for a follow up on this. You know, um, you could construe the notion that it's not just America that dropped the ball. Uh, is this a failure, maybe to, to the three of you, is this also a failure of liberal West, Western democracy? Because the six countries that have the most per capita deaths, Belgium, Italy, Spain, France, Britain, and the United States per capita, seem not to fare nearly as well. And I, I just wonder if this is a, from the Chinese perspective, I know America is the focus, but is this an indictment also of the fact that the Chinese system, resilience, nationalism, trust in government, pride, all of these factors combined to create this notion that we've actually won, we've triumphed, we beat, we, we beat the liberal Western approach? Shall I answer that? Please. So look, that's certainly the story. Um, luckily, uh, so we don't all just kind of despair now, um, it's a bit too soon to say that, isn't it? I mean, I think China is also busy being extraordinarily obnoxious and offending countries around Europe. And China's response, it's it, that, that exceptionalism of deciding to have no infections because they don't have a hospital system that can cope with infections. And also it's a kind of social contract. You know, if you have a communitarian system that puts stability above everything else, then people will lock down a whole city of 10 million people in order to save the other billion uh, in China. That, that is part of the social contract, but that is also killing their economy. And I think that uh, if you talk to epidemiologists uh, who study the Chinese response, they'll tell you that among other things, it's a bet on getting a vaccine quite soon. So if China gets a vaccine really soon and they really don't have that many deaths given their population, then they will look potentially quite smart. Uh, but this is very, very brutal to an economy. I mean, you know, it is still, it's opening up now a bit, uh, but you know, still incredibly locked down, incredibly disruptive. And there are civil liberties issues that, uh, you know, there is no way I think that Westerners would tolerate the degree of intrusion. I mean, to go anywhere in China at the moment, uh, it's not just having your temperature taken, uh, you know, you have to scan a code with your smartphone that then immediately tracks through your smartphone's uh, sort of uh, travel for the last 14 days where you've been, it then generates a health code that says whether you've been somewhere dangerous, whether you've been on a train with someone dangerous. If you have a bad health code, then you're straight into quarantine, whether you like it or not. Uh, school kids are wearing these electronic thermometers on their wrists that beam a temperature uh, to a smartphone app. If they, if they shoot a fever, even for any reason, they've been doing sport or something, straight off to the quarantine hospital. Their parents don't have any say in that. 
you know, that I could go on and on. There's all of these issues. That I think genuinely, uh, you know, China's uh, approach has real trade-offs. And as I say, it's a bet on getting a vaccine really quickly because it's also very, very disruptive to their economy. And, you know, unemployment, we never know quite what unemployment is, but, you know, if they don't have a vaccine for another 18 months, then they have high unemployment, then ask me again whether China's model uh, looks good. My only plea is to take China's model seriously and don't just assume that all the numbers are so fake that uh, the West can learn nothing from it. Right. Well, you made a telling point, and I want to ask Tom and Susan uh, about the notion of Donald Trump letting the Chinese off the hook. Uh, I saw a recent Pew poll, which had 66% of the American public having very negative views of China, up from 40 plus percent only two years ago. From Donald Trump's perspective, he's running against the virus. He's running against the WHO. He's running against China. He may not even be running against Joe Biden. I mean, that seems to be the the, the focus. Um, so is it possible that even though he's let Xi off the hook, he's serving his own electoral interests? So, Aaron, I mean, if you look at the poll numbers, it, it, I do think it's a pretty straightforward uh, campaign play uh, where you've seen Trump and uh, his supporters pivot to China bashing as a way of letting him off the hook, in part because it, you know, seems pretty clear from the surveys we have right now that Americans um, uh, don't find the the Biden bashing and the the sort of personalized attacks on Biden have not uh, produced results. Uh, whereas it seems to be compelling to voters in both parties. Uh, you know, this growing skepticism of China over the last few years actually is somewhat bipartisan at, a, at an otherwise polarized moment. However, the big however here is that it has not, it's not a um, zero sum uh, political game for Trump and uh, blaming China does not seem to have gotten Trump off the hook for his own misjudgments and mishandling. Uh, in fact, there is a, a story in the Post uh, just uh, today that suggests that Donald Trump's ratings are lower in the states than 49 of the 50 U.S. governors. And the only governor who has a lower approval rating at the moment is Brian Kemp of Georgia, because Georgians are very concerned that his uh, abrupt reopening of the state without meeting even the uh, arguably minimalistic criteria set forth by the Trump federal government, uh, you know, have caused real concerns in Georgia. So, you know, it, it turns out that uh, China bashing hasn't helped Trump, uh, at least so far in the way that perhaps led to that political calculation in the first place. Uh, you know, just, I, I think David's account is really compelling and, you know, spellbinding. And it goes to one of your previous questions, which is, Imagine what an alternate response from the United States could have looked like. What would American leadership at this moment, you know, was that even possible? What could Trump done have done if he did something differently? And again, that's where the default setting of uh, viewing America's allies as its adversaries, viewing multilateral organizations uh, as the problem and not the solution, seeing any form of collective action at coming at the expense of the United States uh, seems like the fairly obvious uh, negative consequence. And you know, individual Western countries have not performed well, in particular, the United States and Great Britain, who were led by right-wing populists who, uh, and whose initial approach to the virus was to deny that it was a threat to their society uh, in a way that seemed to ignore the basic principles of science, as Tom pointed out. So, uh, you know, again, it's early days. Collective action uh, is, is possible. I anticipate that regardless of the outcome of the U.S. election this fall, uh, that by next year, certainly the early part of next year, it is the international implications of this crisis, uh, both economic and public health, that are likely, and geopolitical, that are likely to be even more uh, our focus. Right now, we're still in the initial uh, kind of shock phase where we're talking about public health, number one, and then number two, we're talking about internal domestic politics and economic consequences. I think next year, is when the full scale of this international crisis is, is likely to become much more clear, regardless of uh, what happens to, to Donald Trump in our election. 
but I'll, yeah, I'll leave it there. Particularly if there's a second wave. But in terms of that point, and I'll ask Tom, does the United States get a second chance, Tom, to make a first impression? In other words, it, this is the first global crisis that has affected the entire world it, in which the United States seems to be MIA. I mean, well, let me come which in 03 with PEPFAR against AIDS, Obama assembled a coalition against Ebola, Trump assembled a coalition against the Islamic State based on some of what his predecessor had done. Which Obama did um, that. Trump picked it up on What do you think? Well, I'd say a couple of things. You know, I'll, let me start with um, a pick up on, on David's uh, and Susan's points about uh, China is really, really interesting. Um, so uh, on the trade question, uh, my view was that Donald Trump um, has never been the American president Americans deserved, but he was the American president China deserved. Um, that is someone needed to call the game on China and um, it's overreaching on trade. So I actually supported that position generally, but specifically, um, uh, you get to, I think, the, the core weakness of Trump's approach to the world, um, zeroed in on, on China, and, and uh, Susan and, and David both alluded to this. To me, it all goes back to TPP, okay, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. Mm -hmm. So Trump came in, he had a legitimate trade beef with China, and what did he do? He tore up um, uh, a trade agreement um, pulling together the 12 uh, uh, Pacific nations uh, economies, 40% of global GDP, excluding China. Um, we had a framework for managing global trade based on American interests, American values, especially around intellectual property. He tore that up. Then he also launched simultaneously a trade war against China and Europe at the same time. What would have an intelligent American president done? He would have lined us up with TPP, signed TPP, you got global 40 percent of global gdp on our side then gone to the european union and said you guys have the same problem with china that we have then we would have had about 80 75 percent to 80 percent of global gdp on our side then we would have asked the chinese leadership to meet us in secret on hainan island we tell them no one's going to be embarrassed publicly privately though we're going to nail you because i've got 80 percent of global gdp here on this table and we would have made the trade issue the world against china on the right and fair rules of global trade. Had we done that, we actually would have leveraged economic reformers in China uh, who, would, who want to see change on our side. Instead, what Trump did was he made it him against Xi over who's got the biggest tariff, and we leveraged all of China's nationalists on the side of Xi. And we basically spun our wheels. The exact same thing uh, applies with the WHO. We need an independent inquiry out of China on where the, this virus emerged, how it emerged. Um, what we should be doing is, is going to the world and the WHO. I, if, I, if I were in charge, I would ask Singapore to chair a global study with the WTO, a country trusted by China and trusted by the West, and made it the world against China on where the virus came from, in which case we'd leverage all the Chinese reformers on our side. And instead, Trump's making it America against China, and it's all your fault, leveraging all the nationalists on the side. Tillerson said it, he is a fucking moron, okay? And he hasn't thought through any of this stuff. And you see what he did on TPP being reflected in the same way on WHO. Now, um, I wanna talk a little bit, picked up on, on David's fascinating uh, story about how China is approaching this, because uh, as he said, China's got a real vulnerability here, and it goes back to mother nature. Once she's released a pandemic everywhere, okay, there's only, you, you only get out of this when you get herd immunity, because this virus, it, we are warm and, and comfortable protoplasm for it. So the only way you get out of this is whether you get a vaccine that gives you herd immunity or you get enough of your people, 60%, 70%, no one knows exactly how many infected. And assuming that infection buys you immunity, not clear, but pretty clear, you get herd immunity naturally. That's the way Sweden's gone. So if that's the only way and you don't, you don't get like a choice, like that's not fair, that's not moral. You know, If that's the only choice, 
then the uber strategic goal of every government is a sustainable, sustainable plan for saving maximal lives and livelihoods at the same time, because there's a lot of ways to die. You can die from COVID-19 and you can die long-term massive deaths of despair. So the core challenge of every government is how do I develop a sustainable plan for maximally saving lives and livelihood? And this is where, again, the knuckleheads on Fox News, oh, but Trump, Trump was a genius. He closed down the flights to China as if that's what we needed. That was necessary, but it was only a fraction of what we needed from the start was a sustainable strategy for saving lives and livelihood. Now, there are two broad models out there. One is the one that China's adopted um, uh, that David alluded to, which is leverage all the powers of a surveillance state to test, track, and trace and try to suppress the virus. The, the, the uh, uber authoritarian version of that is uh, China. The uber democratic versions of that are New Zealand, you know, basically. And they both got the numbers down very low, but with one important caveat that David mentioned, you can't open up. People say, look at New Zealand, they're great. Yeah, they're an island. And the minute they open up, this thing comes back. You know, it, it's not going away. It doesn't magically disappear. Uh, like Trump says. So that's their strategy. And that's the weakness of it. You, you're going to pay an economic price. And the minute you know, people walk across the border in Jilin province from North Korea uh, or, or somewhere else, it comes back and it can, it can spread like that. The other model is Sweden. At the other end, go for natural herd immunity. Um, that has uh, its um, weaknesses. You have to protect your most vulnerable. They didn't do that in their nursing homes. But people, I find it bizarre having written about Sweden and simply say, I don't know if this works, but God bless them for feeling they had the healthcare system and the social trust to try this other model. Let's see how it works. And the number of people out there rooting for Sweden to fail um, is, uh, is bizarre to me, uh, as if they've offended somebody by trying to take this different alternative approach. And yes, on a per capita basis, They've had more cases and more casualties than some countries, but not others, including us and France. So, um, you know, there's, you know, th there's these two models out there and that's all mother nature gives you. It's not fair, okay? But she doesn't do fairness. You know, something I learned in Beirut uh, or in living in a civil war there for five years, Aaron, which really applies to mother nature. The biggest thing I learned in Beirut, living in a civil war for five years is nobody's keeping score. Oh no, yeah, your house can get shelled, your car can get shelled, and your uncle can get shelled, okay? Um, the same day, okay? You can uh, lose your grandparent by this virus, a tornado can hit your house the next day, and um, you, know, you can get washed away in a flood. Mother nature is not keeping score, okay? And it, it's a brutal logic. So you just, only choices, maximally. How do I maximally save lives and livelihoods? And unfortunately, what we're doing now, again, rather than adopting the China model or the Sweden model, we're adopting the what the heck, I heard it on Fox News, it's okay to come out model, okay? We are disrespecting mother nature. Now the coronavirus is a, like all viruses, they're actually very beguiling. You know, it comes, in, it comes in the decaf version, mild and double macchiato. You know, some people are asymptomatic, it's, it's really, we don't, there's so much we don't know about it. It affects different communities at different latitudes, different climates, differentially. Maybe we'll, we'll get lucky here, lucky there. I don't know. But if you're betting on uh, winning a duel against Mother Nature, she hasn't lost one in four and a half billion years. And that's basically what Trump is betting on. Fascinating. Let's go to some cues from the audience. And let me remind our callers, if you want to ask a question, use the live chat feature on YouTube, email us at pressoffice at ceip.org or tweet us at uh, Carnegie Endow using the hashtag Carnegie Connects. Uh, we have a question here from Joseph Barton who asks, um, Panelists present a compelling account of states' fractured international responses. Do NGOs, foundations, and social movements present a, uh, a counterpoint? I noticed Bill Gates was at the vaccine summit. We weren't. Um, 
but the Gates Foundation was, um, is this a time or is it just the question of governors standing up in our federal system? What other kinds of organizations can make a difference if in fact government can't lead, centralized government can't lead? Well, I mean, in many ways, uh, you know, I think we've experienced this so far initially in the United States as an example of the, the vital role that government still has to play and government can screw it up uh, even if it doesn't ha offer all the solutions. I mean, to me, what's been fascinating about watching Bill Gates uh, who warned very explicitly of this, who put his money where his mouth was, who you know did a lot uh, to try to prepare the United States is you know, he gave an interview to the Wall Street Journal last week in which he said, uh, basically, I have terrible regrets that I was not successful uh, at, at, at making sure that the United States took this seriously enough, as it turns out. Uh, and, you know, I, it shows the limits of what you can do outside our system. You know, in many ways, Trump, right, uh, you know, his main ideology is himself. And, uh, you know, his main goal is self-promotion and put himself in the middle of every story. Uh, but his response offers at least a caricature of a form of extreme Republican ideology of decentralization, of the devaluing of national and federal uh, governments uh, and the uh, devolving of responsibility to the states. Uh, it's, it's a form of Republican ideology that certainly uh, uh, exists and predates Donald Trump and that uh, perhaps in a default sort of a way he has adopted. He often proclaims maximum authority, uh, but at the same time, one of his most memorable quotes, I think that will outlast the pandemic is, you know, asked early on about the failures in testing and the like, he said, I don't take any responsibility at all. So he wants maximum authority, but no responsibility, uh, which I think kind of sums up the approach. But that's also the reason why many state governors, including Republican governors in certain states, such as Ohio with Mike DeWine or, uh, you know, Massachusetts, why certain Republican governors who have uh, differed uh, with Trump uh, ha have nonetheless come out of it broadly popular with Democrats and Republicans in their states. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's a case study, I think, for many Americans in why we need the government. But because Trump has been very successful at uh, signaling to his followers and in the sort of Fox News universe uh, that uh, this is a, a just another partisan issue, uh, I don't know that the legacy of this crisis will be uh, to reinvigorate uh, 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 the identity and role of a kind of uh, empowered national government, uh, frankly. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to see that being an outcome in a society where among Republicans consistently, they have polled this very interesting question of who would you listen to for medical uh, advice during the coronavirus and among both Democrats and Republicans, Dr. Fauci and the CDC have, have often been at the top of that list. But among Republicans, the only segment in our society, among self-identified Republicans, Donald Trump has consistently been uh, either tied with number one or number two as a person you would listen to medical advice from. Uh, you know, in, in that kind of a situation, uh, we're, we're in trouble. You know, Aaron, I'd say to pick up on Susan's point, you know, America right now, we're kind of pretending to be China. We're acting like we want to be Sweden. We're preparing for neither and claiming to be superior to both. That's sort of the Trump administration uh, strategy. And um, uh, while I love the fact that Bill Gates is doing everything he's doing, he warned about this and the Gates Foundation has been awesome. Bill also comes out of a culture of Silicon Valley, even though they're in Redmond, Washington, not Silicon, a really libertarian, anti-government, we don't need you guys, the Peter Thiel, you know, sort of school of, of governance. And um, they're always looking for ways kind of around, they don't really want to get involved in domestic politics, you know, any of these big tech guys. But it turns out government matters. Who holds the wheel of the government really yeah. matters. And in a pandemic, uh, a public health pandemic, it really, really matters.
Oh, we have a question here from Paul Schulte, who asks on YouTube, I guess it pits the past against the future, which is actually an intriguing question about whether or not we could find a way to work with China. He asks, how important is open authoritative investigation of the virus's origins compared to close cooperation with China over vaccines and treatments? Will you see either of those? The Chinese have, David, correct me if I'm wrong, apparently agreed to some sort of international investigation. Well, so they've, they've agreed to an international investigation into the world's response. What they are not, in, not willing to have is an investigation into where this came from. Right. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, you can discount that. I was just keen to, to actually almost answer the last question about, you know, the, the, the role of the state here is a gigantic, clearly there aren't NGOs here in meaningful capacity. And I think it links back to what uh, Tom was saying about the Trump administration's approach to China full stop. I think it's really important to, to note that Donald Trump is, is not a kind of classical China hawk. So uh, before I was Beijing bureau chief, I was the Washington bureau chief, and I interviewed President Trump a couple of times about kind of China when I was still in the States. And he is not fundamentally disapproving of the human rights abuses, what they do in Tibet, Xinjiang. He's not particularly a fan of the Hong Kong protesters. I don't think he fundamentally cares that Taiwan is a democracy and an ally. You know, he basically thinks of China as a place that has a lot of money um, and should be giving more of that money to Americans. And on the trade agenda, you know, Tom is absolutely right that the rest of the world would have been delighted to roll in behind any American president elected in 2016 and have a gigantic discussion about how China was basically obeying the rules, but not the spirit of all of its global commitments, that you had this model of state capitalism, gigantic subsidies, forced technology transfer, a whole laundry list of things that China does, that China is now too big for that to be kind of bearable for any other advanced economy. And there are all these people in the American system who wanted to have that argument too, except vitally the president of America, who he approves of subsidies, he approves of state capitalism, he approves of protectionism. He says China is smart when they behave like this. It's just that his predecessors should have fought back a bit harder. I mean, I, I remember concluding after sort of writing about this a few times that I think Donald Trump thinks of America as a very valuable piece of real estate and that foreigners should pay rent to access the American market. And China wasn't paying enough rent. So he was having a rent review. That was it. But there was no kind of principled objection. Now that I think still matters because now I don't think with the government responses across the whole world as everyone you know, nationalizes airlines, uh, you know, makes whole their work, unemployed workers, uh, you know, the state is back everywhere, gigantic deficits exploding all over the Western world. China is kind of off the hook almost by default there, you know, I mean, if you're China's ambassador to the WTO and you're expecting a kind of tough year of questions about state subsidies and state capitalism, I mean, he, he might as well go on holiday because no one's going to be bending his ear about state capitalism now because everyone's doing state capitalism. You know, Britain and, you know, the conservative government in the UK is, you know, about to now. And so I think this is going to be a really interesting geopolitical, geoeconomic question coming out of this. If China is not just you know, massively propping up its economy, but is employing tens of millions of people in a kind of, you know, communist version of kind of FDR's civilian construction core, and it's just the state is back, and that's how they're surviving this. How much self-confidence does the Western free market camp have if we get into that kind of next stage of this? You know, will that model of, sort of statism that doesn't offend Donald Trump fall away as a point of conflict between the West and China? Will China be basically having a free ride on that front? I don't know, but I think that that's a, it's an important caveat that Donald Trump's, uh, he has, he's picking a fight not with China, the country that has human rights policies and industrial policies. He's picking a fight with China in inverted commas, which is basically an avatar for kind of globalization and people who eat bats and, and pandemics. And that's popular with his voters, but it's not actually a meaningful disputes with China, the real country. You know, to pick up on one thing that's so interesting that David's saying, I, I asked myself this question, um, Aaron, who will um, China and Russia be voting for in 2020? Um, who, who will they really be voting for? Well, Putin, we know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's a... <laughs> right. and is, the, is the China uh, question that typical? Who will China be voting for? And right. I have zero doubt they will be voting for Donald Trump. Yep. 
think that that's counterintuitive, but I don't. It's for the same reason that yeah. Putin votes for Trump. It's because a Donald Trump, Amer Donald Trump as president keeps America in turmoil. So we never realize our full potential. And Donald Trump is utterly incapable and uninterested in developing any global coalition against them, um, against Russia uh, in Europe or against China. So for all the seeming acrimony between Trump and China, um, I, I think they vote for him uh, over Biden in, in 2020. To, your, to the questioner's point though, um, the world will be a, I believe the era of US-China relations, 1979 to 2019, that was actually an epoch. It was an epoch of unconscious integration, not unconscious in the sense of, of you know, we weren't thinking about it, but what, I could wake up any morning and say, I want a supply chain in China. I want to partner with a Chinese company. I want to hire a Chinese engineer or scientist. I want my campus to have a branch in China. I want to have a research center in China. And the Chinese side, you could say, I want my kid to go to Harvard or Ohio State. I want to list my company on the NASDAQ. I want to do business with America. That period of unconscious integration, even with all its problems, produced a lot of peace and a lot of prosperity for the world. It was the engine of globalization. That era is over. And we will, we will miss that. It's over, I think, because China overreached and America underperformed. But we will miss that era uh, I believe when it's gone, the world will be less peaceful and less prosperous and less resilient. Because if you think of the global challenges we face now, managing post COVID, managing climate change, if you um, have a tension in the relationship between the two biggest powers that can drive those, you really, uh, you really have a problem. And it's why I always tell Republicans, I prefer not to use the term China. I much prefer to use the term one sixth of humanity. And what you can accomplish in opposition with one sixth of humanity, especially uh, such a dynamic one sixth, and and what you can accomplish in tension and opposition with them, uh, will be really problematic. You know, we're almost at the end of the hour, and I want to come back uh, to, to a final thought by each of you to Tom and Susan. Um, hard to answer my question: Is is the pandemic? a headline or a trend line? Is it an inflection point that will transform or simply accelerate pre-existing trends, some of which were very negative? Um, so I'd like each of you to identify, if you can, your two takeaways. And you don't have to go foreign policy if you don't want, because foreign policy begins at home. And I think there's no question there's an integral relationship between American resilience, national power, and consensus and how well we can do abroad. But what are your two takeaways with respect to the future of, of this Republic in the wake of this pandemic? And then to David, a final thought, um, is there a takeaway or two that could paint a more uplifting picture about the prospects for uh, some measure of accommodation between Moscow and Beijing. But let's start, Susan, let's start with you. I mean, big big picture takeaways. You guys have covered this. You've been abroad, you in Moscow, Tom, Beirut, Jerusalem, and you've now been in Washington. What do you think the two biggest takeaways are? So Aaron, I, you know, I think that's a, that's a great question to ask. I'm struck by a, a few things that we haven't talked about or that we have only touched tangentially on. You mentioned early on, but we haven't really come back to this notion of what is US national security uh, at this moment. And, you know, pointing out that we've spent uh, uncounted billions of dollars uh, reorienting our national security around uh, uh, counterterrorism in the sort of post 9-11 world. Uh, continuing to be embroiled in uh, conflicts in the Middle East that, that are no closer to resolution today uh, in many ways than they were uh, not just a decade, but in some cases two decades ago. Uh, and you know that's an immediate, I think, head snapping uh, uh, set of questions that, that immediately occurred to people here in Washington when this uh, pandemic erupted, which is uh, what about uh, you know, a rethinking of the threats that will face increasingly, they're not ones, uh, not only are they not ones that can be uh, solved by aircraft carriers, but in fact, aircraft carriers, uh, as we saw, became the vectors uh, of the threat uh, as opposed to the solution to it. And, uh, you know, I do think that we're long overdue uh, 
for a reckoning of what is essentially uh, a, a still a Cold War military footing upon which uh, we have grafted additional spending uh, for smaller asymmetric uh, conflicts in the post-Cold War era. You know, that is not a sustainable nor sensible national security uh, infrastructure. And I would expect uh, there to be some rethinking uh, uh, actually in both parties uh, in a post-Trump era, whenever that comes, whether it's this fall or uh, you know, after another Trump term. So that's number one. Number two, we haven't talked about uh, 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 climate change and uh, the obvious conversation that's unfolding, unfortunately, as far as I can tell, in blue America, but not so much in red America about this consequences in a positive sense of the sort of global shutdown of the economy and looking at how quickly, uh, you know, clean air, uh, clean skies, the uh, uh, rebounding of, of wildlife, uh, you know, the possibility suggested by a different way of life and a different set of economic organizations. Uh, I'm not saying this in any kind of pie in the sky way that this is, you know, naturally the outcome. Uh, but I do think that it suggests on the one hand, a, in a positive sense, uh, a, a renewed kind of focus on this and international organization against climate change as a possibility uh, were there to be a political change in the US after November. On the other kind of darker side of things, I think that you know the pandemic has suggested, uh, unfortunately, the incredible limits in American society, the, uh, uh, the shocking persistence of denialism, conspiracy theories, and anti-science uh, uh, perspectives and people willing to believe Donald Trump's medical advice, uh, take that number and graft that onto climate change and you do not have a very promising uh, outlook for the future of the planet, never mind the future of the country. Uh, but I, I would spotlight those two issues. Tom, to you briefly. Uh, back in 2011, uh, I wrote a book with Michael Mandelbaum called That Used to Be Us, How America Lost Its Way in the World It Invented and How We Can Come Back. And boy, um, I think this, this crisis has only accelerated that trend. Um, we aren't, if, if this crisis has shown us anything, and certainly the world, it's we aren't who we think we are. We, we are not who we think we are. We think we're exceptional. We treat exceptionalism as like it's an honorary degree up there on the wall, and we just can point to people, we're, we're exceptional, it says so on our honorary, honorary degree. But exceptionalism is something you have to earn and re-earn every day. And we've just taken to admiring our honorary degree and this crisis has exposed, as Warren Buffett said, when the tide goes out, you see who isn't wearing a bathing suit. And the biggest entity in the world today who isn't wearing a bathing suit for all to see is us. Um, as Susan said, we lead the world in the number of cases and the number of deaths. How, we are not who we think we are, but what's really scary, Aaron, is to get from where we are to where we need to be. We have to overcome this, what Frank Fukuyama calls this vetoocracy, which has become our country where one side just negates the other. We have big hard work to do and big hard things can only be done together and we cannot get together anymore. And um, so that, that leaves me uh, really worried. The thing that would make me hopeful is if I saw agreement in Washington of not only um, uh, uh, getting aid and, to, to, and, and dollars, literally money to the most vulnerable in America, but if we had a plan for actually um, uh, not wasting this crisis, for actually investing in yeah. the technologies that would um, uh, make us stronger when we came out of it. And those technologies were the big five we've invested in after every crisis, that every great American president enriched infrastructure, education, um, uh, government-funded research, um, the right rules for incentivizing risk-taking and preventing recklessness, and immigration. But we're, we're not doing any of those things. There, there's, there's nothing that says we will come out of this crisis by investing in clean energy to make us resilient in the face of the next pandemic, climate change, by investing in gigabit connectivity to every rural area in America so we can overcome that divide and leverage all that talent and energy in rural America and investing in, in uh, open source uh, uh, platforms, uh, 3D manufacturing that will allow us to really disperse 
our responses and, and enhance our immunity. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I sorry to, you know me, I'm from Minnesota, Aaron. I'm the most optimistic person in the world. Um, but, um, uh, I, I see nothing right now. Um, and the numbers Susan quoted, if this can't break through to you, then, um, then we have a real problem. And the real problem is we've, we've forgotten how to talk to each other and we have zero social trust. And the countries that are all thriving in this pandemic or all at least surviving in this pandemic right. have high social trust and haven't forgotten how to talk to each other. Thanks, Tom. Um, David, quickly, I'm leaving it up to you to leave the hundreds on this call with some measure of hope for the future. Actually, I'm just kidding. Please, what do you what do you think with respect to the U.S. and China? It's not my job to make Americans more cheerful about America right now, um, but I can say that it's not preordained that China will win out of this. Uh, you you could both lose, um, but you know, and I don't want to get hung up on the idea that pandemic resilience in a kind of authoritarian uh, sort of style is the only test of good government because you know if your only test of good government is running trains on time then Mussolini looks good and you know China is an authoritarian state guess what they wield authority uh, effectively so they have had a very effective authoritarian response to this virus but there are non-authoritarian states that have also done a good job and I think what is interesting is if we are looking at kind of post-COVID world where America is kind of creating a vacuum of leadership creating a vacuum because the rest of the world is is basically sick and tired of America first and the obnoxiousness and the total lack of magnanimity of someone like Donald Trump. Well, guess what? China has also been really obnoxious uh, for the last couple of months. There is no magnanimity to the Chinese Communist Party's, you know, any government that wants to buy ventilators, cash from China has to thank China, has to praise China, has to pretend that China donated them. You know, if you criticize the ventilators, you get attacked, you get boycotted. Look at the number of Chinese ambassadors who've been summoned by their local foreign ministries for abolishing the last couple of months. It's an extraordinary list because they are being extremely assertive and aggressive. And so I think it is not preordained that China is ready for the role of global provider of kind of goods and moral leadership and normative leadership. I think it is uh, seeing a vacuum created by Donald Trump and by all the other problems that you've identified in America, but it's not preordained that China is ready to step up with a kind of normative offering that is actually appealing outside its kind of clients uh, in the global south. That's not a reason for complacency uh, in America, and I don't think any of the other panelists are arguing for complacency, but this place is also being really obnoxious, and as I say, that lack of magnanimity, this isn't 1945, uh, Xi Jinping is not about to kind of launch the UN. Uh, it's a much more complicated, messy, uh, possibly kind of zero sum uh, world that we're looking at as we come out of this virus. David, thank you. And Susan and Tom, thank you. Uh, it was terrific. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that, that the three of you were preternaturally honest and very, very clear. Um, and to our callers, uh, if you enjoyed today's show, please be sure to like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date mm -hmm. on the latest content from Carnegie. Uh, and uh, until next time, thanks again.